This is Michael McKeon, a.k.a. Morris Fletcher, a.k.a. Chuck McGill. You know who I am. But it's time for Inside the Gilliverse with Eric Broadbent. You're watching Inside the Gilliverse, talking all things Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. Brought to you by Stewart Travel Guitars. See the incredible stowaway travel guitar at stewartguitars.com. Also brought to you by Idea Bench, makers of hot rod inspired pedal boards and pedal board accessories at ideabench.com. Microphones for Inside the Gilliverse are brought to you by Rode Microphones. Now, please welcome your host, Eric Broadbent. I'm trying to get back. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode 23 of Inside the Gilliverse, our final oh, show yeah. of 2020. And we are talking all things Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. My name is Eric Broadbent, and it comes with extreme pleasure to welcome tonight's guest. You know him as Hector Salamanca from both Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul and countless other productions. The gifted actor, Mark Margolis. Mark, it is an extreme pleasure to have you here. I cannot even begin to put words on how thrilled I am to have you here. How are you? Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm in pretty good shape considering You're... The, the state of things and all other things. I'm fine. I'm great. That's good. Well, you're, you're definitely better than Hector Salamanca, correct? Um. <laughs> Well, I don't have people um, stacking bills together in back of me, unfortunately. Exactly. Hector, Hector does. Hector does. I was talking with Michael Mando yesterday, and I told him you were coming on the show as well, too. And he was saying, I'm, we're going to have a real treat with you. Obviously, uh, another Canadian, one of my Canadian. Uh, well, he's, he's, yes. He's really a, a, a Quebecois, isn't he? Yes, he's in Montreal. Yeah. Yeah. So, which is a great place. Before we get into some conversation, I just discovered that you didn't know about this. And uh, we've got our good friends, uh, Warren and a team from bobbleheads.com and Royal Bobbles. They're, they manufacture some incredible bobbleheads. And uh, they sent, you can see behind me, I've got a stack. They sent me six Hector Salamanca bobbleheads today. And, and Warren, um, Mark did not know these exist. <laughs> so what we're going to do, tell you what, because uh, these are sold out. These are sold out everywhere. And and Mark, you did. I, I didn't even get a chance to tell you this. That sample of that bell, Vince Gilligan sent Bobbleheads the digital sample file from the show. So that bell you hear is what we heard on TV. Really, with me ringing. Yeah, that's it. So, so then I imagine I get a piece of every sale. Something like that. I'm not that you work that out. But I tell you what, they are sold out. Uh, Warren and the team sent me six of these today. We're going to be doing some giveaways. My beautiful Sandra Lee and my son, Eric Jr. Want one really bad. So I'm saving two for them. I'm right. going to be giving some away. I'm going to save one for you because there's none left. I'm going to send you one. I'll get the details and I'll mail it to you. Okay. Yeah, but I actually have the living bobblehead right here in my apartment. So there it's you not that critical. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but we'll get you one. I want to send you one. I'll send you one of these. Okay. All right. Thank you. Awesome. So listen, we've got a lot of great guests here this evening. Uh, I mean, a lot of great uh, people in the chat. I mean, to ask you questions. And uh, I'm going to start off with a couple questions from our YouTube members, okay? And I'm just going to go over to those right now. So this is from Lori. Uh, Lori says, Mark, can you please tell us about your training with Stella Adler and what that has meant to you? Well, that would take up more than the show. <laughs> no problem. You give us a cold well, notes. Or... It was, you know, when I was a kid and I came to Stella... I was, um, I had done a year of college in Philadelphia and then I, I met Stella. I, w I was 19 years old. I think I was barely 19. And my first impression of her was if, if God is a woman, this is him. Because she was larger than life. Everything I know, I mean, you know, it's all inside of me now or whatever, but everything that I, that, that I work with probably came from Stella, though I've been to other people since. Um, but there's so many things of Stella's that stuck with me. Stella was way, way more than w working on 
acting, she taught you just to overdo it a little bit, what it was to be an, an artist in mm -hmm. the world. That's what she was. You know, she was Marlon Brando's great teacher. You didn't know that? No, no, I'm shaking my head like I look at, wow. Like, I mean, that is that speaks volumes. They were very close when she, in the early days of her teaching, um, she used to talk about him quite a bit. They had a couple of confrontations as time went by. So obviously a, a great catalyst to your career. And I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit further into the program, but talking about the shyness yeah, that you... What I got from her that come up every once in a while to help me um, get through something that I'm having a difficult time with in terms of uh, a part. Um, whatever. I, I don't know what to... It's, it's a, a long drawn out thing to talk about. <laughs> Stella, but it was an incredible experience. I was with her for almost three years. There was a period where in exchange for classes, I would uh, work as her assistant. I'd go home with her, get her a cab, uh, take her to her magnificent apartment across from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, where she had incredible paintings laying on her kitchen sink. <laughs> her, her boyfriend at that time was some kind of an art dealer who was, I think, smuggling paintings in from Europe somewhere um, by covering them with the uh, lousy abstracts. Yeah, and yeah. He'd clean, he'd clean it off at the sink. <laughs> well, I hope I don't get him in trouble, but he's probably not alive anymore. Yeah, true. It's probably good. Hey, for a second, you want to be, let's be proud dads for a second, and I'll tell you why. Because we've both got our sons in the chat. Can you believe that? I've got Eric Jr. in chat, and we have Morgan in the chat as well, too. How do you know we have Morgan? I was just told by my beautiful Sandra Lee. She she looks after oh. all the chat, and she saw Morgan's in the chat. Yeah, I told him he might want to watch. Then I'll get a critique. <laughs> and I will, too. He's Aren't actually kids... pretty good at it. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, our kids keep us uh, keep us in line, don't they? My my son's schooling me all the time. Here's another great question. This is coming up from another member of our channel and a friend. And actually, she gave me this beautiful uh, Walter White uh, what do you, hoodie. What do you want to call it here? I love it. For my birthday yesterday. This is from Karina. Yeah, I can see Walter on it. Exactly. This is from Karina, and I love this question. You ready for this? She yeah. says, since you and Giancarlo are so menacing at dialogue-free scenes, who would kill the other one first if looks could kill? Hector? Or Gus? Well, I killed Gus. <laughs> I believe. Yeah, I think you get it. But, you know, I, I know John Carlo Esposito from way back when I was a hell of a lot younger and he was probably in his early 20s. We were in a Lanford Wilson play directed by John Malkovich in New York City called uh, Balm and Gilead had about a cast of 30 people. It was an incredibly big hit. And he used to chase me in one scene with a knife, and I didn't know who the hell he was. And I thought, is he really an actor? Is he some crazy kid they found on the street? Is Am I going to is am I gonna get stuck with this knife? <laughs> and later on, I worked with him in a few things other than the Gilliverse. Okay, okay. So Hector's going to win anyways. It's, 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 it's inevitable. Well, I, that, that's already been done. I know. I know. Hey, you, you and I off the air, we we're talking to people going to the next question from our members and a lot of uh, other chat questions coming in. Uh, we talked about Tom Chanel as my co-host. He's off on hiatus right now writing this, this little lawyer show that's out there. Um, you know something about he's coming back next year, but he sent me an email today and he says, and I didn't tell you this off the air. He says, I'm not sure if you've ever seen this and I didn't, and I'll be the first person to admit I hadn't seen it. The, the ding bell, uh, thing that you did for, uh, it was an app or something. Some Japanese company. That was the strangest thing I've ever, cause I don't do things like that. It all had to happen within 60 seconds. All these moves with a, a steady cam. Yeah with no cuts and it, we worked on it for hours and we finally got it down to exactly that. Now, whether they sold that app, I don't know, but I got an Apple watch out of it among other things. Hey, that's cool. 
I ended up giving it to my son because I prefer old, uh, what is it? My preference is old Bolivars. Oh, I know. I, I, I would be old school like that too. Well, this was my father-in-law, my son's grandfather's uh, watch. Also very, very sentimental. But the Apple watch was an incredible thing, but I didn't much use it. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I mean, I use an Apple iPhone. I mean, I've got one charging right now. I, but just, I'm not really into that. And I stopped wearing watches years ago because I've always carried my phone, so I, I don't really need a watch. But my dad is the same way as well too. Of old school, beautiful, you know, analog watches. I love the watch. I, I prefer the watch to looking up time on my iPhone. Well, I would prefer that if I could do that as well too. I put the phone aside because the phone is just a distraction. Did Thomas Schnau send you that one minute? Uh, ding bell thing you can get it online yeah you should be able to get it online. yeah i tweeted it today and, and you know it's, it's funny because i asked you um by email there last week i said do you have any social media links to share and things like that and it was i was actually very refreshing to find out that you don't and there's many many days as i told you in the email i wish i didn't have social media too because it's it could drag you down this rabbit hole but you know, fortunately, the the family that we've made here through the Gilliverse, it's a very inviting family, and that's the social media uh, social media community that I'm very proud to be part of. So, you know, but I don't, I, I definitely envy you for sometimes not being connected to the outside world with the social media and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> here, here is a great question coming in from Claudia. Uh, she says you have worked with many important directors. Uh, who has been the most demanding so far? Demanding? Mm -hmm. Probably Darren Aronofsky. Okay. The guy who did all those movies, starting with Pi and going all the way to Mother, though I'm not in Mother, I'm in all the other movies. Mm -hmm. He's a very strange, he's a very gifted guy, but he's incredibly demanding in certain ways. And sometimes I have trouble um, wrapping my head around what exactly he wants. <laughs> he'll say something like, you know how we do it. Mm -hmm. I'll say, no, actually, I don't know how we do it. <laughs> so, but I mean, he's, he's very sharp, very smart. And eventually we get it together. Yeah. But I mean, there's all kinds of direct, I've never had incredible demands made on me. I have directors who I loved because they really know how to talk to actors. Mm -hmm. You know, actors, you have to give actors um, actions to do if you want to give them something. Some people are very uh, artsy and they start talking like mm, a sense of blue plat pastel and gray clouds yeah. at the same time. You think, what the hell is he talking about? How do I do that one? But yeah, yeah. Well, I, I the same thing with with Breaking Bad and stuff like that too. When they bring in guest directors, you know, one of the things that um, you know Michael Slovis was telling us, you know, they bring in guest directors and they'd say like they want to start sticking cameras in toilets, you know, and sticking them here and sticking them there. Like there are some cool scenes like that, looking through a vending machine, looking through you know whatever. Yeah. But I mean, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be like. Let's focus on on the on the story, right? Slovis is a great cinematographer. He, he also directed me in an episode of uh, Better Call Saul. He's a terrific director. I like the guy very much. I think the all of the directors I worked with on uh, Breaking Bad and Saul mm -hmm. were quite terrific. They're very good. And and so far as you know, episodic television. I don't know if we, that falls into that, but. It, it only has eight days, eight working days. So they have to be very good and very fast mm -hmm. at getting it done. Yeah. And it's been every single person I've spoke to this year uh, that are involved in both shows, well, three shows, we'll talk El Camino as well, too. There's nothing but praise for everybody from the from the catering to to Vince Gilligan, and everyone in between. It's just a beautiful, beautiful harmony that they have. They had a wonderful caterer. Did they, <laughs> do they, do you have craft dinner? Like we have in Canada, do you have macaroni and cheese over there? Nah, this, these guys used to grill steaks on open fire pit. Things oh. They had salad bars that went on forever. Oh, 
and uh, the variety was incredible. I don't know. Yeah, when when I was out there, they had an incredible catering. Nice. Yes. Well, if COVID is over next year, well, it's never going to be over. But if it's good next year, I'm going to be try to I'm going to try to visit uh, New Mexico and get on that set. Now, I wanted to come and hang with all you guys, but now I just want to come for the catering. <laughs> I'll take some doggy bags back to Canada. It starts very early in the morning with breakfast. There you go. And they're very interesting at that as well. You've never been to New Mexico. Though. I've never. No, I've been to Los <laughs> Angeles and uh, a few, <clears throat> few other states, Florida, a few other states, but no, never no, New Mexico. It's got this marvelous, marvelous um, Native American vibe that pervades the whole state. It's a wonderful, wonderful, mystical feeling especially when you're out in the wilderness areas outside of the towns. It's just an amazing, amazing, magical place. I, I, I would love to live there. I probably will never live there, but I would love to. I did live there for a couple months way back in the 80s. I worked in a theater company out there. Mm -hmm. That's a long time. And as you told me off the air too, like you, it's nice to bring your wife out there as well too. You had a, uh, you know, great, uh, great travels with your wife. She's got, she's got friends out there and she loves it out there as well. And, um, she's also, she rides horses occasionally. She likes to ride horses out there when she can. It'd be nice, fresh air, like the, no smog, you know, just, yeah, I, I can just imagine. Well, sometimes they have the, I think a couple of years ago, there were big fires raging in Arizona and they were blowing back into New Mexico. Yeah, that would be bad. So, yeah. But generally, no, they, they do have, and they have great food. I can't wait to try it. I like Mexican food, but it is, it's their own thing. Yeah, yeah. Their own, their own spin on it, for sure. Here's a good question from Marion Art. Um, did you, did you? It seems like all the questions are coming from women. We have a lot of women in this community. I didn't realize I had such a big following. Hey, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, D D Tom Schnauz created all this stuff. He, the one, we, we had Michael Mando on the show, and before Michael Mando came on the show, my demographic on my YouTube demographics were like like 99.9999 men, and it was like a 0.0% or 1% women. We start this Gilliver stuff. Michael Mando comes on. Now we got Mark Margolis, and it's like 80% women and 20% men. So they, they love you. It's very nice. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, we I turned up on the cover of Vogue. <laughs> hey, person of the year. There you go. Man, sex, uh, Time Magazine, Sexiest Man Alive, or whoever does that, they, <laughs> Mark Margolis. But they, yeah, this is from Marianne. Did you get the email I sent you earlier today with some of the fan art? Yeah, two of them. Do you the, see that? The top one I had never seen. The other one that was in black and white and gray. Yeah. I think I've seen either it or something very much like it. Yeah. The the one that was by somebody named Arctic. Arctic South Sakai. Asia. Arctic Sakai. Arctic Sakai. Yep. That's a very unusual piece. Yeah. I want to give credit to them because Arctic Sakai did that one. It was a painting, the colored one. And Ragava, one of Yeah. Ragava yeah. is over in France. He did the penciled sketch. He did one of uh, Peter Gould as well, yeah. too. So we, I arranged through Peter's assistant to send that to him. So I can also try to get you some of that fan art if you'd like to have it, like real oh, copies of it. Pieces that people have sent to me. Some of them are quite marvelous, very much so. Yeah. Yeah, there's a big, a big demand for it. And also Mrs. Wexler, uh, she sent one late, uh, uh, coming in late. It was really funny. She did a bit of a spin on on Hector. And so Hector's got the oxygen, uh, you know, tubes and everything. But he Hector is on a, a scooter like you'd see in Walmart. <laughs> and I, I, I commented back, I said, now Hector's just like the grumpy old man that you'd find in Walmart running over your feet. <laughs> I've only been in Walmart once in my life. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know the scooter. Yeah, exactly. But it was great. And I promised them I would mention uh, their, their beautifully uh, talented work here. But so Marion says, Marion, she does great uh, drawings as well, too, art, art, artistic things. I want to know about how challenging it was for you, Mark, to play disabled Hector, all the mobility and expression uh, limitations. And I, I understand, too, a lot of that came from a family member that you, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've told that story a hundred times. Yep. My, my, my wife's mother had had a stroke. She was in a nursing home in terrible shape. Um, when we'd come down to, she was in Florida, when we'd come down there, her 
her facial reactions were this. Uh, <laughs> you get excited. So I stole that from her. Otherwise, I'd be sitting there dead, kind of. And so I always say it's an homage to Shirley. That's my wife's mother. But um, it's funny because when they first asked me to do it um, and they sent me the material and they were going to bring me to New Mexico, I thought, uh, oh, this is marvelous. I just have to think I have to live inside. I don't, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> I don't have to learn any. Whereas I've told this story before. I have a friend who was a terrific actor in LA. Um, we worked together many years ago. He recently passed away, unfortunately. Sorry to hear that. Um, but, uh, he, I think he was asked to read for it. And when he looked at the script, his first thought was, he told me, this guy doesn't have any lines. I don't want to get involved in this. It's boring, right? Boring but rule. If, if he had, he's an authentic Latino. I think if he had read for it, he would have definitely gotten the part. Kind of looks a little bit like Anthony Quinn. Oh. But I'm. I'm glad he decided not to do it because then I got into it. I'm I'm very happy to hear uh, Shirley as your mother-in-law. Shirley was my mother's name, and she's passed away as well, too. Uh, she passed away of lung cancer, um, <laughs> and sadly, she smoked right into the day she died and died on her birthday. Uh, I don't mean to take it in a dark, a dark thing, but I'm I'm very grateful to my mother Shirley because uh, she's responsible for what I am today. She's made me, and I always say people sometimes will, they'll say, "Hey, you're a mama's boy." I'm like, "Hey, come back at me when you, when you have an insult." I am proud to be a mama's boy. My mother was very good to me. Yeah, that's good. That's good to hear. Proud of you. I'm assuming. Well, well my mother. I used to tell people they say, "Well, why did you become an actor?" I said, "I wanted to be a doctor." But I didn't want to displease my mother, so I became an actor. My mother was a, a mom, she was a, a she worked as a decorator in a for a wallpaper company, um, but she was also an artist. She did a lot of painting. I grew up in an artsy kind of a scene in Philadelphia, um, but they were always into music and art and acting and that. Uh, so they were very supportive of me becoming both my mother and father, becoming an actor, which is the opposite of what uh, people usually get very upset if their kid wants to become go into the arts. It sounds like the, the road to poverty. A failure. In fact, unfortunately, my father passed away before I actually started to make much of a living as an actor. Oh. And he kind of cried to me that he regretted being supportive because he had sent me down uh, the road to poverty. Right after he passed away, I started working a lot more. It had nothing to do with that, but he never got to see that. What a shame. What a shame. I mean, if you believe in the afterlife and you believe about our parents looking down on us, I, I, I mean, I'm not a very religious person, but I do have beliefs and I believe my, our parents are looking down on us. I'm sure he's very, very proud. I mean, and that resume that you have, I mean, people getting to the business today would just, uh, would just kill for that. But here's a, a question coming in. This is what we call a super chat question uh, from one of our viewers, Josh Gordon. Can you talk about uh, working with Jim Carrey and, you know, fe another fellow Canadian, uh, I love Jim Carrey, and seeing you with the, being the landlord, uh, can you tell us about Your that? Chicken dance. <laughs> By the way, that name, the director, um, who I think the director's name was Caddyshack, which is even weirder. Mm -hmm. He said the the name Mister Chicken Dance was because he used to have a landlord named Chicken Dance. But when I when I went and worked in um, Ace Ventura. I didn't really know who Jim Carrey was because he, he was only known from a show called In Living Color. Right. I had never seen it, so I didn't know who he was. Uh, he was quite manic. Um, I mean, he never stopped. It's like a, a go, go, go. that goes on and on. But he was very funny when we would, we would uh, rehearse. He would do, like, there's a... There's a line in it where I say, uh, I, he says he's not, he doesn't have any animals. And he says, uh, 
I say to him, well, what's all the pet food for? And he says, the fiber. <laughs> uh, in the movie. But when we rehearse, I said, what's all the pet food for? And he would say, kinky sex. <laughs> but that's the only movie I was ever in where they asked me. They wanted a, a voice, like something out of The Exorcist. I had never seen The Exorcist, but I figured it was that. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. The Haunting Landlord. I never did a voice like that, but it, it, it actually... The funny after when that movie first started playing, I had like seven year old kids telling me how much they liked me. I'd never run into that before. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Yeah. It's like it's like being part of like Star Wars or something, you know, like you just bring the to me, you do a really good job. <laughs> That's awesome. And now they're those seven year old kids that have come in, they're probably watching everything that you've done since. But I thought Jim Carrey should have gotten me to play also in Ace Ventura number two, which happens in Africa. I could have been up a tree still trying to get my rent out of him. Yeah. But He's chasing him around. You still owe me for that rent, Ventura. But no. a lot of people are big on that and they're big on chicken dance. Yeah. I, I enjoyed the movie and I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to, I'm just going to be a uh, uh, fanboy for a second. I had Steven Bauer on the show a while back, Don Eladio, uh, you know, one of your partners on the show. And Scarface is everything to me. Uh, Star Wars is epic in my life, but Scarface, if I could have one movie and I could only watch it for the rest of my life, and I, that's the only TV I had, Scarface would be it. So to well, have from, you... From, from what I encounter, I believe there are tens of thousands of people in the world who that is the only movie they watch all their life. <laughs> <laughs> exactly they base their lives on it yeah not exactly yeah. the best role model show you know but still i, I that alone is like insane you know the, the one of the the early tragedy was that when that movie opened it was way ahead of its time mm -hmm. in some ways the critics bombed it they hated it when when i went to the opening night they had a big opening in new york and they had a lot of celebrities there and all that people got up in droves and walked out on it it was embarrassing. I kind of sunk down in my seat. I didn't know what was, why they were reacting that way. Mm -hmm. And look at now. <clears throat> and when you see uh, it advertised in a newspaper, they still use the negative reviews from 1984. It'll say Scarface, over the top operatic. It is somewhat over the top to the degree that it's larger than life. It is. But that's the beauty of the thing that it's larger than life. Agreed. Al Pacino says uh, he did say at one time that it was his favorite role or performance in his life. Wow. Yeah. I, I really loved it. I mean, it, intense, intense, intense. And look what it did for the Gilliverse, right? You know, like that's, that's what Vince is. He basically wanted Mr. Chips to Scarface and that's, that's the ev evolution of Walter White. But um, here comes another great question, and this is from a friend of ours, Eamon, and Eamon helps us greatly, one of two people to help us on our show. When uh, we have some technical trouble, he'll stand in and they'll stand in. Him and Matt will stand in for our guests to help us make things work. And Eamon says, let's make sure we get an answer to the usual, who did Mark get the death call from? Or should I say uh, bomb call or whatever? Like, uh, uh, So, yes. I, I, I was expecting it. And the, the, there was a guy that called me up one afternoon or morning, I think, and it was Vince Gilligan. And I knew that would, that that was what was coming. That, um, um, that they were going to kill me, but I was really going to have a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> according to <laughs> Vince. And I had a very, um, what, what's the word? I had a, a, Vince directed that episode where I blew myself and, and John Carlo up. Yep. Face off. Uh, and I had a, I don't know what you call it, an epiphany or yeah. Skilligan showed me something uh, about how brilliant he is that I just shut me down real quick. Um, the curtains? Do you know about that? I do. Yeah. <laughs> you said, you said. I've told it in other, I don't have to tell it. No, no, it's good. It's good. Go ahead. Because you, it was focused on the curtains. You go ahead and tell it. It's funny. Well, there was a moment where 
Walter White jumps out the window from my room because um, uh, uh, John Carlo's bodyguard is coming in to check the room. Tyrus. Um, yes. And uh, so we stopped and they were setting up the cameras and Vince was moving the, the curtain, part of the left curtain in, part of it out. Then he did the right side in, out, and he was moving it up and back and up. And, and I was sitting in the wheelchair, just staying as I was, um, watching him. And at one point, um, I said to him, Vince, if this whole scene or episode is dependent on how those curtains are sitting, we're going to be in deep shit. <laughs> he said, no, Mark, no. It's all in the details. And that's Vince to and a that T. just shut me right down, and that's why he's brilliant. Yep. Because he's into the details. Isn't that something, right? It, whether I, the curtain... Yeah. It was a real lesson for me. Yep. I got a couple lessons working in that show. There was, in the first episode I ever did, Walter White said, uh, Brian Cranston said something to me that was very, very smart. Uh, gave me something to do that was something that I wasn't doing. And uh, I was really pleased to, that he said that. Usually actors won't say something to you, but in this case he did. Nice. That's nice. Yeah. Um, further questions coming in and that's, I'm glad you, I know that question comes up a lot, but I, I'm, I'm really glad that you told that because that goes to show the, the, de the detail that Vince goes to and it always wins. It always wins. Um, Ursula says, do you have a favorite Tio scene? And that's a tough one. Well, I love this. No, it isn't because I, I, I had always, I'm a big fan of Jonathan Banks. <laughs> Okay, we, we, we love him. Huh? We love yeah, him. Everyone I, does. Yeah, I'm crazy about his work. Um, I had when I was doing, I call it better coleslaw. Better coleslaw. Um, they gave me a scene where I come into a diner and sit down with him. He doesn't know who I am to try to convince him and offer him a bribe to not. Uh, uh, give testimony against my nephew, Ray Cruz or Tuco. Mm -hmm. I loved working with him. I really did. I just, he's, I didn't even know if I could handle it, but I did. Yeah. I saw a really good interview with both the, uh, some of the DVD extras with you and Jonathan Banks. And you guys are just kind of spitballing back and forth, talking about your careers, talking about some of the actors that have to work, some of them that just comes naturally. That was a beautiful, beautiful interview between the two of you. You're just kind of spitballing back and forth. Um, and since, since I saw him last, I heard uh, that during the fires in Malibu, this house that he loved burnt down completely. I did not know that. Yes. I mean, it's probably, but... He used to say all the time, many times to me, he said, I only made one good investment in my whole life. I bought this house in Malibu, I think somewhere in the late 80s. Uh, this was only a couple of years ago, two or three years ago. Okay. The, the house burnt down. I, oh. guess he, I heard he didn't even have any clothes. People, they had to lend him clothing. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, that mm -hmm. is. That is. Uh, we have another super chat question that came in from Shawshank. Uh, Shawshank says, uh, w so we talked about kind of the paralysis and things like that and, and portraying that role, but this is a little further. He says, what were the challenges in navigating the pre-paralysis character of Hector Salamanca on Better Call Saul? That's a good one. Well, that was easier in a way because I was liberated mm -hmm. from the wheelchair. I was mobile. Um, um, I was able to talk. Uh, the biggest challenge for me, I'm not uh, Latino. I do speak some Spanish. I took it in high school and a little bit in college. And I lived in Mexico when I was very young for a couple of months. I've been to Spain. But I'm not a really uh, authentic uh, speaker in Spanish. But they had some great, uh, there was a woman, a Colombian woman that they, who taught at the, I think the University of New Mexico. 
um, she was a marvelous tutor for speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. I had a marvelous tutor in uh, in Scarface, a Bolivian guy, who showed me how to to speak the language so I'd sound very authentic. Right. And I, the few lines I had in Scarface were only in Spanish because my character, Alberto, didn't understand a word of English, mm -hmm. which was part of the conflict with Al Pacino. I don't know what the hell he's saying to me. And he's annoying me. But um, so the, the I used to get frightened whenever they sent me a script with a couple of pages of of Spanish. But when I worked on it slowly and this tutor would send me a, uh, tape recordings of her speaking the line slowly. I'd say, send it to me slow and then faster, normal. I would get it together. There have been people that write in saying, he doesn't sound authentic. He's not authentically Mexican or da 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 and Because each, you know, the, the people that speak the best Spanish are either the Spaniards well, I think the Colombians and the Bolivians. But I do my best. <laughs> you do very well. You do very well. Um, we have another Super Chat question. This is from Ragava himself, who did the pencil sketch of you. And I'm going to make sure we try to arrange to get that to you. Uh, Ragava says, um, <clears throat> you're a legendary actor with decades of experience. Uh, who is a young actor that you have admired recently? And what is it that you like about them? Uh, well, first of all, Regatta, thank you for doing such a marvelous, intricate sketch. I used to work in art galleries when I was younger, selling very high-end painters in New York when I was a kid. And that's a quite marvelous. Now, there's a whole bunch of young actors who I don't like, but I don't want to say <laughs> them are. And they, they get raved about, and I don't understand why. But I may just be a bitter old man, a, a nasty curmudgeon. My wife usually says, well, you're just jealous of them. Maybe, I don't think so, but who's a young actor? Boy, that's a tough question. Why did he have to give me that? I know, right? Puts you on the spot. Way to go, Regava. <laughs> How young does he mean, though? Oh, I could be, it could be 20s, 30s even. It doesn't have to be a, a, you know, a teen. I mean, there's a guy I'm crazy about, but I worked with him. He's younger than me. Mm-hmm. Actually, for Ragava, the actor's a French actor. He's really, he was Turkish and he moved to France. Okay. Named Cechi Cario. I worked in a movie about Christopher Columbus. But Cechi's already in his 60s. He's not a young actor. <laughs> so He's younger. A with... guy. Let me think of who, 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 who. Uh, God. There are some that are so terrific. I, I've. The minute I this whole interview ends, you'll have ten answers. Twenty of them, um, and there are young, some women, young women who are incredible actresses. Why can't I think of somebody? It's okay. I, it's okay. I, I know it. Same as me too. I'll be thinking as many after we after the show too. I'll just say Chris Walken. Yeah, there you go. Uh, here is a question from Renata. This is good. Uh, and we've actually reached out to Raymond Cruz's uh, uh, publicist as well, too, to get Tuco on the show. But Renata says, did Hector really uh, love Tuco or actually fear him? I only spent one episode with with Tuco. Mm -hmm. And I went to dinner with him. Uh, <laughs> I liked the guy, sort of. I mean, he was a madman in the scene. Yeah. Yeah, that first that first episode that I did was out in that cabin with Tuco. Um, I don't think I ever saw him again. Um, I think they wanted to keep him on the show, and he wanted to be back in L.A. in some episodic thing. I think I think he made a mistake, but I don't know. Yeah, um, I know he had a lot of people that were crazy about him. Yeah, he, he, I can't honestly, I mean, there's certain things like in music, I always say you take your favorite like band and you pull the, the lead singer or the guitar player out there and you just can't replace them. Let's pull Tuco out of that scene and try to recast anybody else. I mean, I can't think of anybody else who could have delivered the scenes that he did, the intensity. And he said it was very demanding. He, he, it wore, physically wore him out. 
Well, he's an ex-boxer. He's mm-hmm. a tough guy. I believe Raymond was a, a boxer at one point. Um, but he's doing a lot better than me. He's got a publicist. <laughs> I have a, my son has a publicist who occasionally has done things for me, but I've never really had a, when I was nominated for an Emmy, I had a publicist briefly. And you know what, with, with booking guests, publicists, I love them to death. I mean, there's the management, there's this and there's that, there's all these different people. And that's the hardest part is booking the guests for these shows. And the publicists, I love working with them. Uh, they're, they're, they're great. I, I mean, because the publicists are the ones that generally work with um, the, the talent on a, on a daily basis. They know where you are at all times. But th- that being said, too, your team, I've spoke, I don't even know how many people I've spoke to with your team. There's in that well, email thread. Manager, I think my manager, Rob. Yes. Yeah, Rob. Rob has been great to me. Uh, to and there's about four other people included in that that circle. So there's some people working to help you Rob's out. Rob's very good to me. He's he's my manager, but he he often takes care of so many things. I feel like I have a wonderful personal assistant. He, Especially he's, when I'm traveling and working, he looks into every little detail of it. Just like Vince, he's in. Yeah, people. yeah, he's great. Very good that way, you know. It's, I, I think he, I, I, he's a couple of times implied that I don't appreciate him enough, but I think I do. I'm sure you do. You know, it, it threw me for a loop. So I was, my sole communication with you is through Rob. And there, obviously, as I mentioned, there's several people CC'd on the email. And so I I'm dealing with I have agents. He's my yeah. manager. He knows who have agents. Yeah. And so one of the things, uh, you know, we always set our things that like we've talked about New Year's resolutions and what we want to try to do. And I, everything I try to improve on, at least I, I, I given a realistic, a very realistic goal. So my goal for uh, New Year's resolution is going to try to get back to people faster. I'm bad for that. Someone will send me a text message. Sometimes I don't get back to them. They'll send me an email. I don't get back to them. And I told my, my better half, Sandra Lee here. So y- you must have got my contact through Rob or something. And you emailed me and asked me about how can I share this event tonight with, uh, yeah, with a fr- friend. Yeah, I know my son and a couple of friends know about it. I don't know how many of them are. Yeah. Watching. Well, I hadn't even had the YouTube event created yet, so we have to create the event. Then I can give you the link. And I was, I told, I told Sandra here, my better half. I said, "You don't make Mark Margolis wait. I'm stopping everything I'm doing. Mark Margolis, give him an answer." And so I jumped immediately on it, created the YouTube event, and I had an answer back to you in about ten minutes. Very nice of you not to make me wait, but I, I didn't think most people make me wait. I, I respect you greatly, and I, I know they all do as well too. But that's I can't get to the head of a line. <laughs> well, I'm using you as maybe a crutch to help my to my New Year's resolution get a little bit better. So uh, credit goes to you. Uh, here yes, comes. I, I don't think I've ever had a New Year's resolution. I should have one this year. Well, they usually they usually tank. They usually they don't work. But I'm going to try. Uh-huh. I'm going to try. Here's a question from Shiv. Uh, says, hey, Mark, how was it? This is funny. I'm going to try to say this with a straight face. Um, how was it shooting the DEA scene where you leave them a gift on the floor? Oh, I, I love that. Well, that's, that was an, an opportunity for me. Years ago, <coughs> years ago, <coughs> after Stella, mm-hmm. the teacher, <laughs> I, I went for about a year and a half. 10 years later to Lee Strasberg, who Stella wasn't crazy about. Mm-hmm. I don't know that he was crazy about her either. And during the summer, I kept going and there was a guy who ran the Lee Strasberg Institute who was one of the teachers there. And a guy got up to do uh, what was called a private moment where he was going to sit on the toilet and take a dump. So this guy, I I can't quite remember what his name was, this teacher, who was a not bad teacher, he faulted the guy because he said, you know, when you take a dump, your eyes roll up toward the top of your head. And later when I thought about that, I thought he's wrong. The only people whose eyes roll up are babies when they're shitting in their pants. You can see it in their eye. The <laughs> eyes go up. Exactly. So, but I thought that was a nice way, even though 
adults don't really do that as far as I know. So I haven't spent that much time watching people move their bowels. I used that. I thought, here's a great opportunity. And I let my eyes roll up toward the ceiling as I did what they placed that underneath afterwards. That was not me. That was a disgusting scene that I really enjoyed. <laughs> a disgusting scene that was enjoyable. That's that's fantastic. Um, and I missed a super chat earlier from uh, from Andrea Nowak, and I apologize on that. I think it said something along the lines of wishing everyone a Merry Christmas. I'll wait for my better half, Sandra Lee, to funnel that back to me as well, too. Um, uh, I'll make sure I, I get that for sure. But Antonello, uh, one of our viewers and friends from Italy, says, Eric, please ask Mark if there's one uh, Breaking Bad actor he had more feeling to work with and stayed in touch even after the show. Um. There, there are no actors in TV or film that I stay in touch with. In fact, the guy I mentioned in L.A. who was offered my part, he worked in Scarface with me. Mm -hmm. He's the only actor I can think of that I stayed in touch with for 30 more or more years. I mean, I guess there are a few. More often when I was in a play in theater, I'd stay in touch with um, their uh, there was there's a guy who played my sidekick um who lives in Houston they killed him off um i stayed in touch with him through text um but we used to work together in quite a few scenes uh i had scenes where i drove to my ice cream parlor mm -hmm. and he was in the car with me his name is uh I think it's Vincent Fuentes. Um, I forget what the name of his character was. But I I, I would have loved... I, I, I had a couple of... Uh, I ran into uh, Aaron Paul a couple times. Nice. My son has run into Aaron Paul and spent time with him at, I think, gyms and things like that. But none of the other people. I once... <laughs> I was sitting in the L.A. airport waiting to go, uh, not L.A., the, 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 the Albuquerque airport, mm -hmm. drinking a coffee at some little cafe. It, it's a very nice small airport. Um, and people would walk by and recognize me and say, oh, you're the guy from Breaking Bad, da, 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 or Better Call Saul. And uh, then this woman came by and she said, Hi, how are you doing? I said, fine. How are you? She said, fine. And she said to me, you don't know who I am, do you? I said, I, I don't think so. She said, it's me, Ray Seahorn. What? <laughs> I had had hour-long conversations with her about various things and about some theater company she worked with in Washington, D.C. And I didn't recognize her because she was, I think she was in jeans and... Yep. We were in the airport, so. Isn't she something? That's why people don't have long-term relationships with me, because I don't even know who they are. <laughs> no, is oh, she I, I've run into Walter White a couple times Brian. in Studio City. Yeah, he he's very inspiring. You know, him and Aaron both right now doing the Dos Hombres, uh, uh, you know, Mezcal business. That seems to be going very well for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the blue stuff or whatever? No, I don't. I Karina, our friend here, Karina knows a lot more about it, and and Michelle and all all Mezcal of our. is a drink. Yeah, I've never had it, but they say I sh I should. I went into a restaurant on Ventura Boulevard in L.A. Mm -hmm. and I, I ate on the terrace with my wife, and then I went inside the restaurant to use the men's room, and when I came out, the manager said, "There's a guy here who wants to say hello to you." And the guy started yelling over from the corner, ah, you're Hector Salamanca, you're Hector Salamanca. I said, I'm not, I'm Mark Margolis. That's who I play. Mm -hmm. I am now, you're Hector Salamanca. So I walked over toward him, and in because it was dark in there, it turned out to be um, Ryan Cranston. <laughs> you thought some fan, it, some drunken sitting, fan. Sitting with a friend of his who's also in Breaking Bad, um, Javier. I can't remember Javier's last name. They've been friends for years. Okay. Oh, that's that's an awesome story. 
I think it was blew my mind. Yeah, I guess so. And you're probably thinking, okay, I'm not that guy, man. And, and then meanwhile, it's, it's empty. like one of those drunks that won't leave you alone. I love you, man. I love you, man. I love all your stuff I've seen you in that movie. Yeah. 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 Here, here's a good question from Nat Romero. She says, uh, I just got to scroll back to find it. It was a really good one as well. How did you feel when you got the resurrection call? For Better Call Saul, a lot of these people getting that phone call. So we got a spinoff now. It's legit. How so? You heck, no resurrection to go into. Well, basically, it's a it's a it's a prequel. So Hector lives. I thought it was great because I got to go back to New Mexico, <laughs> and my wife was even more ecstatic because she likes it even better than I do, which is hard to believe. So. Um, it's it was that show was uh, probably a big favorite of mine. The Breaking Bad leading into Better Call Saul. It, it's such a wonderful, wonderful world of film. And here again, thanks to our viewers who know a lot, many times, almost all times, know way more than me as the host. Uh, I'm learning as I go here. I just love talking to you. But Karina says, fun fact, um, Mark did not meet Jonathan Banks until Better Call Saul. Never met him while even while filming Breaking Bad. Is that correct? No. I didn't even meet him in, in Better Call Saul. I never met him in Breaking Bad. Wow. We met him when we did the scene in, uh, in Better Call Saul. There's a lot of people that I never, I only, uh, I think it was like maybe, the next to the last, I, I only did two, the last season I did one or I don't, I think I did two episodes, the fifth season. I never met Bob Odenkirk until that last season. Okay. And that was only in the, uh, coming out of my trailer in the parking lot of, uh, of the studio, something like that. I ran into him. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. I've I've never met any any of you uh, uh, folks in, in person, but I look forward to the possibility of maybe on set sometime uh, uh, in 2021 if all goes well. Uh, so we're just about the end of the program here. Just a couple other questions here. This one is from and and this is a really good question as well too from Hippie, and I'll I'll say this as well too. Um, I I myself like look up to all of you actors. I've had had many of uh, the cast and crew from Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, now coming on the show, and I usually don't fanboy out and like lose my kid like I, what i've always tried to say is when doing these shows is um you know chris farley rest in peace he did a, this really really funny skit uh and bob odenkirk even written uh, wrote the the great skit for him the uh, van down by the river but chris chris farley interviewed uh, paul mccartney sir paul mccartney and said do you remember when you're in the beatles and then paul's like yep and he's like that was awesome so i try not to never be that person as a host but i do sometimes get nervous I thought I was going to be nervous with Vince Gilligan. I was a little bit nervous with Vince Gilligan, but I'm I, I'm not going to lie. When I told my wife tonight, I said Mark Margolis. Mark Margolis is on the show tonight, and I was a little, you know, I got some shakes, right? So, but I've got it under control. So this is a segue. Hippie says, "Was there ever an actor that Mark was a fanboy of back in the day, male or female, that just kind of got the jitters? You maybe meeting him? Yeah, I mean, we when I was young, we all wanted to be Marlon Brando. Mm -hmm. There were actors like Brando, Montgomery Cliff. Uh, it went on and on and on. There were these amazing, even uh, even Bogart. Um, it, it never, I could think of dozens and dozens and dozens of them, especially from my, my childhood, the ones that were major. Mm -hmm. um, and even as I got into my teens, um, yeah, I was a big, I mean, I was a fan. I wasn't writing letters to them, but <laughs> it's crazy about them. I'd go see anything that Brando was doing. Mm -hmm. I saw everything that he did. Um, and there were actresses who I was also crazy about. So, yes, I was, I was a fan. Yeah. Well, that's the nice thing I, l I like to always profess here on the show is that, and, and with our music shows as well, too. Just, I mean, we look up to the... In the music world, we look up to the Eddie Van Halen's of the world. Rest in peace, he's passed away. We all look up to these celebrities, but then they look up to the celebrity. So you guys at the same end, at the end of the day, you put your pants on the same way. Uh, sometimes might have a nicer belt and some nicer boots than some of us. But, uh, you know, we all, everyone has their heroes as well, too. Here's one last question before we wrap up, and this is from Andrea. 
Uh, she is, she just absolutely loves uh, Michael Mando as a, a, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of the women do in the Gilliverse world. Uh, let me see if I can find where she said it. She says, um, I lost it, but she's at, well, how was it to work with Michael Mando? No comment. Okay. <laughs> is he is he demanding? Not at all. No. I I've um, heard I've heard a lot of good things about him. It, and and it's such such a beautiful way he communicates as well too. He does. I'm not sure who he is. <laughs> He's just like that other that other crazy Canadian. That's right. They're gonna have to kill him off in the next season. I'm I I, I mean I. He does not make it into Breaking Bad. I don't want to be the person to. I'm not going to lose viewers over this, but I'm feeling, I'm feeling it, and I'm sorry, Andrea. Um, I'm we're feeling some some bad vibes coming for for Nacho. Well, he was in an interview where he said maybe wonderful things could happen to him, and Jonathan Banks, I think, turned to him and said, "Are you kidding? This is this is the better call Saul." Yeah, what's wonderful about this, right? It's fantastic. Well, listen, Mark, I'm, I would love, love to extend an invitation to have you back in 2021. And I wish uh, nothing but uh, the best for you and the family for a great new year. This has been a bucket list moment for me uh, and our viewers here as well, too. I'm going to save one of those Hector Salamancas. Okay, that can be saved for you. And I'm going to package it up. I'll get you, I'll email you and get you a post office box or whatever. You can send me your address. I'll send you one of the ones that Bobblehead sent me today. And we're going to give some away as well, too. But uh, thank you so much for gracing us with your, your your presence. And It was enjoyable. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Is it Don Hector approved? <laughs> it's been a pleasure. And, oh. and I, I'm going to say goodbye to you off the air, but you're our final guest of the year. And uh, yes, you are. We Right, the year's on, but that's only because the year's almost over. That's right. Yeah. Well, we could have done one on Christmas Day. It's a Friday. Or that's our normal show. But no one's going to want to watch on Christmas Day. They're going to be with their families, even though this Gilliverse family is one of the best families I've ever met. Um, and I honestly, I can't think of a better way to say goodbye to 2020 and celebrate an, a fantastic guest like like you. It's it's an honor. Your 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 IMDb resume is like a shopping spree at CVS Pharmacy as far as the length of the receipt. That's the length of your uh, your credentials, and it's incredible. Really? Yes. Okay, you've played in a few uh, movies. By the way, I, I had a I had a I had a, a great number of uh, interesting times working with Michael Mand. Good, good. And you know what? I I, I always ninety nine percent of the time uh, I neglect my questions He's for. Always our, been very nice to me. Good. I usually neglect my questions for our our fantastic audience and our viewers. I'm just going to say one thing because it was paramount that I wanted to do this with this show for you because, you know, in all your interviews, you get asked many, many similar questions. And I'm sure I bring up some of the, the similar ones as well, too. But I really wanted to, I see so many interviews where people say to you, oh, yeah, you're always the bad guy. You're always the bad guy. And you're not. not always the bad guy. I know. And that's. No, you know why? Because my bad guys stick in their mind. I know. But I've played, you know, in my whole life, maybe I've played 12 bad guys. I've played 65 guys that were good guys, but I guess the performance isn't that good. No, 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 you've done well. And that was honestly, I would not be doing my justice as someone who's hosting these shows if I didn't point that out, because I admire that greatly. You've done daytime soaps. I mean, so that was oh, the, those were 100 years ago, but still, yeah, so, but in, those are not. Those are not wonderful experiences. They're, they're lucrative, and you can get your day done in two hours in the morning. And yep. you're going home when everybody's going to work. But yeah, but yeah. I I want to at least point that out that there's a lot more than just a bad guy to uh, Mark Margolis. Yeah, there's <laughs> there's the miserable guy. <laughs> Nice. I don't want to get out of bed, guy. I need a coffee, guy. It's time to go to bed. You know, I, I get it. I get it. Well, listen, I'm going to say goodbye to you off the air. Everyone, thank you so much. Uh, I would, a few thanks I'd like to say here, too. So thanks to to Rob over on uh, Mark's team and all the, the fantastic staff there. Thank you to my beautiful Sandra Lee, who makes this show uh, function every week. Thank you to our moderators. Thank you to our YouTube members, all those people that are in the chat that have little colored icons. Those are our members. You can uh, become a member by hitting the join button down below. 
Thank you to our Patreon supporters. Thank you to the people that buy our merchandise at the Broad Stash Boutique. And just thank you for watching this show. And uh, we're going to start it off again, Season 2, New Year's Day. We'll be, we'll be back. But uh, what a way to go out with Mark Margolis. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Everyone, we'll see you soon. Have a Merry Christmas. If you celebrate, be safe out there. Wear a mask. Do all that good stuff to prevent this thing. This is the first time I haven't worn my mask. That's okay. We're safe. We're, we're zooming. I'm, I'm in my bedroom, so. That's right. We're good. I think it's safe here. I, well, who knows? I'm not going to question what goes on in the bedroom, so I, we'll just leave that alone. I'll say goodbye to you out there, Mark. Don't go away. Everyone, thanks so much, and we'll see you Friday, January 1st. Actually, at 3 p.m. Eastern, because we're talk, we're doing a German time zone. So see us at 3 p.m. Eastern, New Year's Day. And until then, everyone, we love you all so much. Cheers. Thanks again for tuning in to Inside the Gilliverse with Eric Broadbent. Be sure to check back each week for more great discussions and interviews with cast and crew from Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. Please like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends.